So Psalm 45, we've been in this for many more weeks than what I suspected. I, I don't know why I continue to be surprised. No one else seems to be, right? They give me a hard time at work that it's been like two years and we're, we're only in the middle of Acts. So, um, But we just like to dig in. I don't want to leave anything out. I want to see all that God would have for us there. So we've, we've made it down to uh, verse number 13, and that's where I want to pick up this morning. Um, we, we saw the glories of the king at the beginning of the psalm, and now we've begun to understand what the king has done for his queen. We saw his queen, that's you, church, at his right hand, at that place of power. And, and so we were reminded to forsake our father's house. We saw the gospel call in, in verses 10 and 11 last week. Those that forsake their father's house forget their own people and turn to the Lord, that turn from the old ways, uh, that, that uh, cry out to him where all things are made new. The king will greatly desire their beauty, we saw in verse number 11. And um, we must acknowledge him as Lord and we ought to worship him and give him the glory that is due him. We consider the daughter of Tyre and the riches being brought into uh, the church, the, the, uh, um, those that are made kings and priests in the earth, the glories of the nations being brought in as God saves individuals out of each of those. And then also we understood that the things that men are working so hard to maintain and keep here in this life they're not going to, right? Uh, the meek shall be the ones that inherit the earth. We saw that last week. And so all that men are running after, uh, we need to be reminded to not set our hearts upon these things, but instead to store up for ourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust can't corrupt it and where thieves can't break through and steal. And so we want to pick up this week in verse number 13. And we read that the king's daughter is all glorious within. Her clothing is wrought of gold. Some translations add something. If they're faithful to put it in italics, like the King James uh, usually does, um, they'll have to be honest and say those words aren't there. But they, they uh, read the king's daughter is all glorious within. The new King James adds in, in italics the palace. And I assume they take that from the fact that we've been talking about the palace. We talk there. Um, ivory palaces are mentioned in verse number eight. Uh, we talk about uh, coming into the king, and maybe the, they're assuming the palace is on our minds, and that's why it must mean she's glorious within the palace because there she is with the king at his right hand. But I don't think we need to add anything to that verse. I think it's good, just like it is, uh, that the king's daughter is all glorious. It's not about in the house. It's about the inside of her, right? She is all glorious within. Uh, she, she, she is simply some add in her chamber, but she's glorious on the inside. And why is that so? Because her Lord makes it so, right? The Lord makes her glorious inside. Look at Psalm 51. Uh, we're right here at it, so we might as well turn over there. Psalm 51 and, uh, and verse number 6. And we're, we're familiar with this psalm. This is the psalm... Uh, that David wrote after Nathan came into him and his sin was pointed out. And, and, and uh, you know, one thing about David is he was quick to acknowledge his sin. He wasn't like some of these other kings that when the prophet told them what they had done wrong, they threw him in jail, you know, or had him killed or something like that. David immediately acknowledged it. And so he's crying out for mercy uh, before God. And he makes a comment here in verse number six. He understands his state, the state at which he was born. I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. That's how we all enter this world, right? Not simply when we come forth from the womb, but at conception, he says, I was conceived in sin. Because of the fall, all of mankind, uh, it, it, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so we, we enter this world at a place at odds with God, right? You were once the children of wrath, even as others, Ephesians says. What does God desire? Listen to verse number 6. Behold, thou desires truth where? In the, inward. in the inward parts. Thou desires truth in the inward parts. And in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. David acknowledges this is a work of God. And so I, I, I would submit to you that whenever it reads in Psalm 45 that she is glorious within, that's exactly what it means. Because God desires it to be there in the inward parts. 
He desires there to be beauty on the inside. And that's what David acknowledges here in Psalm 51. I can look great in the eyes of everybody else on the outside, but God doesn't look at outward appearance, does He? The Lord looks at the heart. And so she, this woman, is one that is beautiful within. Her Lord has made her beautiful within. We, we quoted a portion of this last week. I'll quote it to you again. Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for her. For what reason? That He might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the Word that He might present her to Himself a glorious church. She's glorious within, right? A glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be... What are we talking about? Are we talking about literal wrinkles? We're in, we're in trouble, right? If that's what it's about, I'm in trouble. I told you guys about me brushing my teeth, and Josh, she's like, Daddy, what's that? You know? Get out of here, boy! Uh, we're in trouble if that's what he's talking about, but, but the rest of the verse says that she should be holy. He's talking about a glory on the inside. Holy and without blemish. She is made glorious within. She is made glorious within. It's like the emphasis over there in 1 Peter 3. You remember that? A godly woman that she should not adorn herself. That, not that outward adorning, the plaiting of the hair and those types of things. But she needs to be adorned on the inside, right? With that meek and quiet spirit. It's the, that internal beauty that is the issue. And her Lord has made her beautiful within. Uh, Revelation 21, I want to read this. Hold your place in Psalm 45. I'm going to read it because we're probably, if we get there, we're going to refer back to this. Revelation 21. By the way, young people, that's what you're looking for in a spouse. Looking for beauty within. Revelation 21 and verse number 10, And He carried me away in the Spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Here's the new Jerusalem. Here's the church. This is the, she has been made, like we read, that she's been made a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such, such thing, holy and without blemish. Uh, by the way, why do we know it's the church? Because verse number 9 says, Come hither, I will show thee the bride. The what? The, lamb. the Lamb's wife, right? We're talking about the Lamb's wife here. And listen to verse number 11. What does she have? The glory of God. The glory of God, right? I mean, I've already told you guys, what right do we have to even be listed here along with this king? We've seen him in all of his beauty and in all of his glory at the beginning of the passage. And then you get halfway through this thing and he's like, oh, by the way, here's my queen. I don't deserve to be there, Lord. I don't deserve to be included in that when we're beholding your glory. But you know what she has? She has the glory of God. God has placed his glory Upon her, having the glory of God in her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. God makes her glorious within. That glory starts within because this, that's where God desires it, in the inward parts, because He looks not on outward appearance, but upon the heart. This, this second half of this verse here, verse number 13 in Psalm 45, is interesting as well. I almost just skipped over this because we had already talked about it, uh, back there in, uh, in um, verse number 9 when we see the queen that she did stand in gold of Ophir. And, and so we talked about that righteousness that uh, God has given her, that righteousness which the Lord, He became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. But I, and so I thought maybe we would just refer back to that and move on. But I looked up the word Ralt there. What's that word Ralt mean? And I'm glad I did. <laughs> really glad I did. Let's back up uh, to Exodus 28. Again, make sure you keep a marker there in Psalm 45. Exodus 28. I want to show you the only other place that that Hebrew word is used in the Scriptures. And it always is in relation to the garment of the high priest to the clothing of the high priest. In Exodus 28, I'm getting excited just turning over there. 
In Exodus 28, beginning in verse number 9, And thou shalt take two onyx stones, and grave on them the names of the children of Israel, six of their names on one stone, and the other six names of the rest on the other stone, according to their birth, with the work of an engraver in stone, like the engravings of a signet, shalt thou engrave the two stones with the names of the children of Israel. And thou shalt make them to be set in, and what's the word? Ouches. Ouches of gold. Not a word we use very often, right? That word ouch is there is the same word wrought over there in Psalm 45. It's the only other place you find it. It's always ouches everywhere else in the King James anyway. The literal translation says plated work of gold. But the names of the children of Israel were engraved here upon this onyx stone in ouches of gold. And thou shalt put the two stones upon the shoulders of the ephod for stones. Why are these stones here? Why are the names of the children of Israel listed here? These stones are here of memorial unto the children of Israel. And Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord upon his two shoulders for a memorial. Sounds like memory, does it? For remembrance. Before, because when I come in before God, the high priest displayed those names of the children of Israel upon, this, upon his shoulders as a memory, as a memorial before God that remember your people, Lord. As the high priest came and interceded on behalf of the people of God, remember the people of God. It has to do with the high priest bearing the names of the children of Israel as a memorial before the God, before God. And who do we know is the high priest, children? It's our Lord Jesus Christ, right? He, the high priest was a picture of Him. He is the great, our great high priest. And so we see the high priest of God, the great high priest, our Lord Jesus Christ, eternally keeping the church in remembrance before God. Isn't that good? Man, <laughs> hallelujah! Well, that's why you ought to look these words up, right? That's why if we're going to study these words, we ought to go back and look it up. We have so many wonderful tools that make it so easy to be able to do that today. Why wouldn't we, all right? That's beautiful. You're not going to find this word anywhere else. And then it just gets thrown in there in Psalm 45. And if you didn't go back and look at it in the original, you never would have known that it was connected in any way. The only other time that it's used, I thought that was absolutely beautiful. Church, He will never leave us nor forsake us. You know what it says about our Savior? That He ever liveth to make intercession for us. He ever intercedes for us before God. That's forever. He will ever bear our names before God the Father as a memorial to keep us in remembrance. We will ever be upon His mind. We will never be forgotten. We will never be forsaken. We are eternally remembered. Man, that's a blessing. Some of these Psalms, they talk about the wicked and it talks about how they'll be forgotten. Not the church. They will never be forgotten before God. They are eternally remembered. Hallelujah. Let's move on to, to verse number 14. Verse number 14. In Psalm 45 and verse number 14, she shall be brought unto the king in raiment of needlework. And again, this is one of those cases that you're going to miss the blessing, the fullness of the blessing here, if you just look at the English translation. When you, when you look this word up, uh, the raiment of needlework, it means embroidered work of various colors. Embroidered work of various colors. This is what she's clothed in. She's brought to the king in raiment of needlework in these, this garment of many colors. You can't help but think about one place in the scripture, right? Your mind immediately goes to who? Joseph, right? Because he had, we learned that in Sunday school, right? Joseph had a coat of Many colors. Why did Joseph have a coat of many colors? Look at Genesis 37. Genesis 37. She has, she's brought to the king in raiment of needlework in this garment of various 
colors, this embroidered work of various colors. And over here we read in verse number, as we begin to uh, hear about the wives that Jacob had. And Joseph was 17 years old in verse number 2. Uh, he was feeding the flock with his brethren. And uh, he brought an evil report to their father concerning what the sons of the other uh, wives were doing. Jacob, Joseph was the, was the offspring of, um, of Rachel, whom we know that Jacob loved more than Leah. We, we read that earlier in Genesis. Why did Joseph receive this coat? Look at verse number 3. Now Israel loved Joseph, just one word, more. Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. And so what did he do in order to show that? He made him a coat of many colors, right? Why did Joseph have this coat? He had this coat because his father loved him more. Loved him more. He was loved above all the others. Church, I'm going to bring this up again, but I keep thinking about what Brother Hubert Davis said. He said, if the church ever figures out who she is, if the church ever sees herself for who she is, revival is going to break out. She can't help but rejoice. She can't help but, but glorify God. The hallelujahs will start coming if the church ever understands who she is. Church, God has set His eternal love upon you. God has set His eternal love of God upon you. There is a love of God that is revealed to all of His creation. There's a love of God that is displayed to all His creation. Matthew 5 tells us why ought we to love our enemies and bless those that curse us and pray for those that despitefully use us. Because our Heavenly Father causes His reign to fall on the just and the unjust, right? That we might be seen to be the children of our Father. But brothers and sisters... There is a love of God that no creature on earth is ever going to know but the church of Jesus Christ. There is a special love that God has set upon you. It is an eternal love. It is a love that makes you unlike any other creature on this planet. She's clothed in a coat of many colors. Why? Because God loves you more. God loves us more, church. We are His beloved. We are the apple. Of his eye. His focus is upon us. Brothers and sisters, he came here to redeem us. He left the portals of glory and suffered as he did and condescended to the point that he did because you needed help and he was the only one that could give it. He has set his eternal love upon you. He loved you more. He loved you more. In understanding there is a love of God that is displayed to all His creation, there is, I must also understand, there is a degree and a level of intimacy that the world will never know. It's a love that prompted the Savior in the garden in John 17 to pray, to say, I pray not for the world, but for these that will believe, that do believe, and that will believe on my name. I do not pray for the world, but this is actually how he said it, but for those whom you have given me. There you go. For they are yours. We are the apple of his eye, and though our love is now set upon him, we know why it's set upon him, don't we? We only love him, why? Because he first loved us. Because he set his love upon us. Brethren, we're supposed to live like this. It says in Galatians 6.10, do good unto all, but especially, right? We're God's especially. You get it? Mm -hmm. But especially they that are of the household of faith. God has set His eternal love upon us. If Norm was here, I'd get him to lead us in that song that we sing sometimes, O oh, love that will not let me go. Amen. She comes in this raiment of needlework, in this raiment of various colors. Let's look at the second half of that verse in Psalm 45. She shall be brought unto the king in raiment of needlework, 
a testimony, a token of this special love that the king has for her, this special love that the Lord has placed upon her. It says the virgins, her companions that follow her, shall be what? Shall be brought unto thee. Shall be brought unto thee. You know what the passion is of all those that are truly part of the body of Jesus Christ? We're not seeking to draw men unto ourselves. We're seeking to get men to Jesus, right? Every true minister of the gospel is not desiring that he stand in the spotlight, right? My job is to get you to Christ. Amen. When someone comes to me and says, Sir, I would see Jesus. Woohoo! Hallelujah, right? That's exactly what I want. We rejoice in that. And so now those who follow her, what happens to them? They are brought unto the king. They are brought unto the king. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, 1. Let's go over there because I'm going to read a passage in 2 Corinthians. So let's just go on over there. 1 Corinthians 11. The apostle says, be ye followers of me. But he doesn't stop there, right? That's not what this is about, Paul said. He, in fact, Paul says earlier, is it earlier in this or maybe it's earlier in, in 2 Corinthians. He says, you guys saying I'm of Paul and I'm of Apollos, stop it. Here's the bottom line. We're all of Christ, right? That's the issue. We're, we're just vessels that the Lord uses to get you to him. We're planting and watering, but none of this works if God doesn't give the increase, right? And so Paul writes, I, I want you guys to follow me. Be followers of me even as I also am of Christ. So you follow me only in, in as long as I am following the Lord because the point to this whole thing is follow the Lord, right? My sheep hear my voice and they do what? They follow me. The goal is to get you to follow the Lord. The, 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 this kind of language is used throughout the Scripture. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, right? Right? Where does obedience to the parents cease to happen? Where do we break off from that when to obey the parents would be to disobey the Lord? Because the point in obeying your parents is that you're doing so in the Lord. You're doing it in obedience to the Lord. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Again, he adds that. We're to submit to the authorities that God has placed over us, but to what degree? Only in as much as we are submitting to God Himself, right? The point is to get men to God, to get men to Him. Not like people that always want to mediate. I always want to stand in between you and God. No, I want to get out of the way, right? I want you to get to Jesus. You come to me and you ask me about something, I will pray with you. I will, to the best of my ability, I will tell you what I feel like the Lord is saying in that circumstance. But I don't want you to go through me. I want you to go to God because He's the one that's got all the answers. I'm just like you, right? I'm crying out to God for wisdom just like you. But God is the source of all wisdom. And by the way, children, He gives it liberally to all that ask Him. The goal is to get men to Christ. And I want you to see what Paul wrote to the Corinthians in the second letter. I just realized it's, it's like almost exactly the same place in the second letter. Second Corinthians 11, the verse I want to emphasize is verse 2 and not verse 1, but he says in verse number 1, Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with what kind of jealousy? With godly jealousy. I'm not jealous over you just for my sake. I'm not jealous over you because you're talking about leaving me and going somewhere else, right? I'm jealous over you with godly jealousy. And so what does godly jealousy prompt? For I have espoused you to one husband. And the apostle says, it ain't me. I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to who? To Christ. That's my job. And so these that follow her, where are they taken? They're taken to the king. These that follow the bride, they're brought 
to the king because that's the goal, right? We're not here for our glory. We're here for his glory. Paul didn't get upset whenever it said the Bereans searched the scriptures to see whether he, whether or not what he was saying was so because we need you to check us out, right? Because I want you to see not what I say. I want you to understand what God says. Because my desire is to present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. We're out of time. We will not finish Again, and you saw that, right? It was the virgins, her companions, that followed her. That was his desire, to bring them to the king. Any thoughts as we close? No? Brother Gary, every time I listen to your lessons when I'm out of town, somebody says something. It just upsets me so. <laughs> Oh, no. All right. Uh, I was thinking when we were reading it before you got to expounding on it, the virgins go in with her and they go and they're brought to the king. You know, there is an idea, and I believe it's true in the scriptural and God and what have you, that I am the bride of Christ. And all my brothers and sisters are the bride of Christ. Yeah. So there's a corporate marriage, and I believe there's an individual marriage. Amen. So it's really, she's coming in with a bunch of queens. <laughs> but her relationship to him is queen, and all these others are virgins. And I kind of see that as the individual in the church. Yeah, amen. And that's, that to me is the way that you understand this whole passage, because it keeps jumping back and forth between the individual and the many, right? How do we understand that? Well, because the church is one body, but it's made up of what? Many members. That's, that's, the, that's the church. That's, what, that's who God is called from out of every nation, kindred, and tongue. Thank you, brother. I believe that's what sheds light on that passage there and helps you to understand when you see those two groups. Amen. Let's pray.